Well, I was born in Columbia, South Carolina uh, in 1954. My parents were merchants. Um, my grandparents were merchants. Um, my great-grandparents were in business in the Pale of Settlement in the Ukraine, now the Ukraine. And as far as we can ever remember, uh, my people were traders in sales. Um, so I broke a family tradition by not being a merchant. Um, in fact, all my siblings did it, as most of the Jewish community of America did and, uh, in the last generation. Um, I um, attended public schools in Columbia, graduated in desegregated high school, uh, Keenan High School in Columbia in 1972. I was the student body president. And I attended Duke University, where I graduated in 1975 and attended law school at Duke and graduated in 1979. I practiced law in Columbia thereafter until I was appointed to the, to the United States District Court bench in um, August 2010. Um, I am, um, as a child, I remember segregated facilities, buses, theaters, uh, restaurants. I remember that. Uh, my father, uh, one of his businesses was in Five Points, which had a substantial African-American community nearby, and many of his customers were African-American. Um, he had African-American employees, including salesmen at a time, but that wasn't the normal practice. Um, so um, I grew up uh, uh, being white in the South was a real advantage obviously, because African-Americans were treated very poorly. Uh, uh, being Jewish uh, gave me a certain perspective as an outsider, so I never felt uh, that, um, that I was entirely in. That gave me a sort of sympathy for others who were not, a natural uh, inclination to, to appreciate the uh, challenges others faced. It doesn't seem that odd to me. I, I had a wonderful undergraduate experience, had um, a, a lot of involvement with the history department at, at Duke, and had great professors, really stunningly good professors, who took a lot of interest uh, in, in, uh, in me and, and I in, the, in their work. Um, so I was around Bill Chafe when he was working on the Greensboro book, and Larry Goodwin when he was working on um, Democratic Promise. Uh, we heard we had lots of speakers come in who were the authors of other books. Um, uh, I got to know C. Van Woodward at um, at some point through Dr. Goodwin, and um, actively considered doing graduate work with Dr. Good with, with uh, Dr. Woodward. Woodward and um, um, uh, elected to go to law school instead, but I had an interest in history, a continuing interest in history throughout all of that um, period. When I was in law school, I wrote an article on South Carolina history um, that was published while I was in law school, and I gave talks on that. Um, so I am, um, and then as I began practicing law, it's a very, um, what was the old line, it's a jealous mistress, and uh, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time uh, learning how to practice law and um, and in that process I probably you know didn't spend a lot of time in my early years writing I did write some stuff uh, but as the years went along I, I began writing various articles of interest to me on, uh, on civil rights history and legal history um, but um, I didn't really contemplate doing that when I went on the bench um, Again, I'm learning a new set of skills. Uh, but I had a curiosity about Judge Waring, uh, who was a predecessor of mine. His, um, his um, courtroom, I was conduct presiding in his courtroom where Briggs v. Elliott was tried. That's a sobering event where the courtroom where Thurgood Marshall argued for the first time that, that uh, Plessy should be overturned. Um, I am, um, um, and I wanted to know what changed it. So I didn't approach, um, I didn't even think about writing a book. I wasn't even 
thinking directly about, um, or even, I'm not even sure I was only dimly aware of Isaac Woodard, um, but I was aware that he had changed, and he had changed in a fundamental way in the years in which he um, was on the bench. And, and I thought it was interesting, just historically interesting, what had changed him. And he was a very well-known figure at this period, and during his, a certain era, in the late 40s and early 50s. And many reporters asked him basically the question, what got into you? And he would give a stock answer. While on the bench, I developed a passion for justice. Wonderful statement, but exactly what was it? Because dozens of other Southern federal district judges um, presided in the same era, and they didn't develop the passion for justice. So what exactly happened to him? What caused him to say, you were talking about the fork in the road. He said, you know, I've reached a conclusion where I either had to, um, to um, uh, follow the dictates of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law. I mean, he, he basically reached that. So what, what, what was it? And, um, and I, that curiosity uh, got me to look in a sort of systematic way at his docket and his experiences and trying to figure out uh, it was to, un to solve that puzzle. About mm -hmm. what, and I then discovered Sergeant Woodard and this highly unusual case that was tried in front of him in 1946 and um, about midway through his career as a federal judge. And uh, uh, he had shown glimmers of sort of progressivism, but nothing that would really challenge segregation or disenfranchisement. And, um, and the experience of this case, um, in my view, was originally a hypothesis, I came to con be convinced of it, but it was originally a hypothesis. This hypothesis, basically circumstantial evidence that before this, there were certain statements he had made that weren't really reflective of an attitude that he later adopted. And um, so I was able to narrow it down to about a, a two-year period, and then looking at his docket, there really wasn't a lot that would explain it other than this. And once I started chasing uh, the story and learning more about it, I became increasingly convinced that, um, that this was the case. So, you know, I had spent 30 years practicing law um, as a litigator, uh, investigating, uh, pursuing, organizing complex cases and presenting them in a way that was coherent. Uh, I got I had gotten you know, pretty good at developing evidence and expert evidence and so forth, finding resources. And when I came on the bench, I learned additional resources that were available from my position. And so when I started to try to answer this question, I knew about procedures of the court, practices of the FBI and the Department of Justice, um, uh, something about locating of medical records. Um, uh, I, I, I had a, a sort of good feel about how you go get information. And um, people have asked me, well, did the fact that you were a federal judge help you get some of this information? I think it probably did, you know. Uh, uh, I, I never, you know, invoked it in any way, but, you know, the, it, it, I, I was a kind of curiosity as I was contacting people. I remember I once um, wrote the city of Batesburg, town of Batesburg, and I did it on my personal stationery, and I said, you know, uh, I'm writing pursuant to the South Carolina Freedom Information Act requesting information concerning a uh, prosecution trial and Conviction of, of Isaac Woodard in November of 19, February 1946, and um, please provide me your response within the day, 15 days provided by the statute. And a couple of days later, I, I I hear my judicial assistant on the phone. Yes, sir, he's here. He'd be glad to talk to you. And it was the town attorney from Batesburg, and he said. Um, uh, it's not every day we get a Freedom Information Act request from a federal judge. <laughs> you could have just called me. I said, well, I wasn't trying to use my position. I just was using what any citizen could do. And he says, you know, that's really, this whole letter really set me back because 
I didn't know what you were talking about. And I'm not just the town attorney. My father was the mayor of Batesburg. I grew up here. And I've never heard this story. So I called my dad because I looked it up on Wikipedia and I was stunned that this police chief of Batesburg had been prosecuted for the blinding of a American, African-American soldier. And dad had never heard of it. But dad went over to the uh, archives of the town and went into the basement uh, and found the documents. He says, I have them for you. But we don't know the story. Now, you know, that uh, I probably wrote a hundred Freedom of Information Act requests as a, an attorney seeking informal discovery in cases. Um, I knew from uh, from uh, presiding over criminal cases that every uh, interview by the FBI uh, has a has a formal interview form called a 302. I wondered if they existed at the time because it was a federal prosecution. Uh, FBI inter investigation. I knew the Department of Justice had files. Um, I wanted the files from this case. And, um, you know, I put a chase on those and found them in the back of a, of a warehouse in Maryland on the National Archives. And um, so there's a lot of those stories. One of them involved Bill Nettles. Uh, the Bill Nettles story was that, um, that I gave a speech to the U.S. attorneys. In what year? Uh, probably 2012, maybe, um, and um, I told him the story, uh, what I knew of it at the time. Of course, it evolved over time, and the they, those guys just loved it. And uh, Mr. Nettles um, said to me very casually, I'm not sure how sincerely, if I can ever help you, just let me know. Well, um, I had dinner a couple years later with a forensic pathologist. And I said to her, I want to try to prove how Isaac Woodard was blinded. There's a, the, the officer who struck him, beat him, claimed he only hit him once. And he claimed that he was beaten viciously and then the end of the baton was stabbed into both of his eyes. We know the nature of his injuries. Um, can, I, can I prove one way or the other? She says, well, if you can get me an x-ray or a, an interpretation of an x-ray, there are certain things I'm looking for, and I can answer definitively your question if you can find it. Without it, I don't think I can give you an opinion. So I called Mr. Nettles, and I said, you know, you offered to help me, and Isaac Woodard was treated at the, at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Columbia in February to April 19. 46. Now, finding a VA medical record one day after it is rendered is often difficult. That is, I used to have clients who carried around their own VA files and got copies of every uh, medical encounter because the VA constantly lost their medical records. So they would literally show up with a duplicate copy of their medical records when they went to get treatment. So here I am asking for um, records 70, 75 years old, when in fact, you know, the current, um, currently, my clients always were traumatized ever trying to get anything. So Bill, I said, Bill, if I call the VA or write the VA, they'll tell me they can't find it. I need your help in getting to somebody who'll actually look. He soon arranged for the uh, general counsel of the VA to talk to me. He was on the phone, and I told the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. She was like completely engaged. She said, oh my goodness, well, let me see what I can find out. A couple of weeks later, Bill called me back and said, well, um, I, I, she says she's got something for you. Interesting. So she gets on the phone, she said, I got, you want the good news or the bad news? I said, well, give me the bad news. She said, well, Sergeant Woodard's um, medical treatment uh, was over 70 years ago, a normal uh, disposition of medical records. They have long ago been destroyed. I said, what's the good news? He applied for disability, and his disability records include his medical records. 
I said, great. Mm. And and it was an x-ray report. X-ray wasn't available. It would have probably dissolved by then, but there was a report. And I took it to the forensic pathologist, and she looked at it, and she said, Isaac Woodard t told the truth. The police chief lied. I said, how do you know that? She said, because to fracture, to crush the, the, the uh, globes of both eyes with a single blow would require fracturing the nose and the orbits of the eyes. They are unfractured. It could not have happened. And if it had happened, he likely would have died because it would have gone to the brain and killed him. The fracture would have gone right to his brain. So I didn't think it was true, but I couldn't prove it without the x-ray. She gave me a written report describing all of that. And you'll know in the, um, in the appendix to the book, I describe the medical basis, uh, determined how I determined how Isaac Woodard. So I proved from 1946 to 2019, I was able to reconstruct the circumstances that led to his death and who was telling the truth. Now that's not altogether different from what I used to do in uh, in in cases. I mean, I, I would hire reconstruction experts to figure out something like that. So obviously, my background gave me some notion about how you might do it, and then a little bit of a little help from your friends and a little blind luck. There it was. Well, you know, um, I am. Um, uh, uh, you remember, I'm in the middle of, of a new job as well as I'm working on this. And um, so it required, and I, I never had been able to go home at the end of the day and work on something else. I mean, I'm too tired. So um, I had to work on weekends and on holidays. And You know, the federal government's blessed with a variety of federal holidays that would produce three-day weeks, weekends, rather than two. And, I would go on vacations for a week and work from Friday, Saturday morning of one week until Sunday of the next week. So I'd get 10 days in. And I did that over seven years. So, um, and, and then there were times I didn't, I was too busy to work. I was too, I was working on weekends on my, on my, um, on my court cases. So I couldn't really uh, do it. So uh, it took me seven years. I was very slow. Um, uh, but I am, um, so I, I had this initial um, curiosity about what change in uh, weight is wearing. And I, when I developed the hypothesis, it was this case, United States versus Shaw. I spent a lot of time chasing information about that case from a lot of different sources. Newspapers, uh, the NAACP papers, um, the FBI interviews. I mean, I had a lot of a lot of sources, um, and then I asked myself, "How in the heck did this case ever get prosecuted? Who, who, you know, white Department of Justice prosecuting a white police officer for blinding a black man in 1946? That was virtually unheard of. How did that happen?" And as I began digging on that, uh, and trying to answer that question. Uh, I ran. I saw some reference to the fact that Harry Truman had some involvement, and that caused me to communicate with the Truman Library, thinking that if there was anything to this. And I spoke to a guy at the Truman Library, and he says, "Isaac Woodard." I said, "Yes, sir." And he says, "I think you're going to find some information I have very interesting." And that led me to the story of Harry Truman's personal role, including the letter in which he basically directs the Attorney General to prosecute the Wood Shull for the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And, um, and the whole sequence of events thereafter I got from the Department of Justice, including the letter of the Attorney General. So I, I was putting the pieces together. And so now I had, okay, I've got the man changed. I've got Harry Truman involved. I've got, and Harry Truman this whole, it sends him on a journey that eventually he orders the desegregation of the armed forces of the United States by executive order. 
which is, I think we can look back and say was the beginning of the end of, the end of Jim Crow in America. And then we have Wade is wearing, I trace his journey, and he writes in the dissent that becomes the model of Brown versus Board of Education. Now, what two events uh, in, in the um, sort of prehistory of Brown set about this revolution? Number one, the desegregation of the armed forces, and number two, the, the legal concept that becomes Brown per se violation of the Constitution, which is Wade is Waring's contribution to Brown. So I now said, oh my goodness, the story of Brown is going to be retold. It is not, as these are lovely people in Topeka, Kansas, very courageous. They send their daughter, Linda Brown, to school. I don't want to take anything away from all the plaintiffs in all of these cases. They're all remarkably courageous people. But this was a South Carolina case. This came out of um, Wages Waring pushing Thurgood Marshall. And that's another part of this story that I put together, which was, um, um, ha you know, the NAACP had a, what was a very effective legal strategy, very incremental, careful, built one, one case on top of another, never getting ahead of the U.S. Supreme Court. So they had brought cases in 1950, culminating in um, uh, graduate schools, law school, um, 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 Sweat v. Painter, graduate schools of education, uh, McLaren versus Oklahoma Board of Regents. They built these cases, and their plan was next to go to college, public colleges. Then they were going to go to high schools outside the South. And then they were going to go eventually, eventually, to the rural South, maybe a decade away. And here was Wade Waring pushing Thurgood Marshall. Oh no, we're not doing that. We're going to go to the, the most isolated rural school district in America, in Somerton, South Carolina, and we're going to end it for good in one shot. And it was an incredibly risky, very risky decision, uh, 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 that uh, risking strategy that, that, uh, that um, Wade Waring was promoting. And that story that Wade is wearing pushed Thurgood Marshall is not something you found in any books up to that point. It's not there. So how did I come up with that, that piece of the story? Well, I am, you know, welcome the internet, right? And I'm searching constantly on the internet, inserting words like Wade is wearing. Well, if the judge was Tom Jones, I wouldn't have had much luck because that had been a million Tom Jones. Believe me, there's only one way to swearing. Okay, so I come across a um, an interview by a guy named Alexander Rivera. Mm -hmm. He's interviewed at Duke, and it's an oral history project at Duke. And he, uh, uh, Alexander Rivera, I come to learn, was a African American reporter for the Pittsburgh Courier, and he is also a photographer. And he is a, um, um, uh, he is a fraternity brother and close friend of Thurgood Marshall. In fact, he travels with Marshall when he goes to try cases and he reports for the Pittsburgh Courier, major African-American newspaper of the day. And Rivera was also a photography bug. He constantly took photographs. He, people who described him is never seeing him without a camera around his, his neck. Well, el as an elderly man, he's interviewed by a duke. And he says his father had been president of the NAACP in North Carolina. He had been, you know, obviously present at a lot of events. We talked about being meeting Moses. You know, you know, Alexander Rivera had been there with Marshall at every turn. And they were big, they were big buddies. And he starts telling the story of Thurgood Marshall being summoned to Judge Waring's office when, for, when they're at the, he's in the courthouse for a pretrial conference. He walks up to the chambers with Marshall and waits outside when Marshall goes in. And when Marshall comes out, he tells him what happened. Later, I found Rivera had done another interview 
with the with the, the UNC with the University of North Carolina Southern Studies and told essentially the same story. Maybe one of them, I can't remember, in more detail than the other. So I'm sitting on a whole, this is a, a very sensitive subject that the architect of Brown is pushed by way it's wearing. I mean, how does, you know, number one, there are whole kind of ethical issues with a judge doing that. And then there's the whole question, did it really happen? Right? I think it, 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 I actually have reports, news reports, from the pretrial conference that immediately followed. And it corroborated basically what Rivera said happened before. But it's the kind of thing you wouldn't find in a court record. It's only in an interview after Marshall's dead and, uh, and um, Rivera is an elderly man. So I'm kind of a little bit of a quandary, exactly how do I deal with this? Basically, um, I mean, every time I speak in front of judges, they all want to talk about the ex parte communication. Everybody wants to talk about it. It's an interesting, believe me, it's interesting. I didn't endorse it, I simply told the story. So I was up at a judicial conference and there was Nathaniel Jones, United States District Judge, United States Court of Appeals Judge for the Sixth Circuit, a Carter appointee, one of the a few Carter appointees to the appellate court bench. He had been general counsel of the NAACP, not the Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP proper. The same organization, obviously, Julian Bond was the chairman of the board. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine, Judge Childs, uh, said to me, Rich, you know, I, I don't think Nate is old enough, he's in it to 90s, and to have been, you know, around, particularly uh, in, uh, he would have been just getting out of World War II, he was a veteran, but maybe he knows something about your, you know, your book, and you ought to go talk to him at your conference. So I go up to Judge Jones, I tell him I'm working on this, and we got to sit and talk. And he said, we'll do it. Well, one day when, another day, finally, last day of the conference, I said, Judge, you can't leave without talking to me. He said, let's go right now. So we sit down, my wife's there with me. And he said, what you working on, Gargle? I said, well, I'm working on a book about um, what is wearing. He said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know who, Judge, who Judge Waring was. And about a conference, and I'm interested whether you had ever heard anything about a, a private ex parte conference with Thurgood Marshall. He says, I know about that. Tell me what you know. He tells me the story. I said, how do you know that story, Judge Jones? He said, Walter White told me the story. Hmm. Walter White, of course, was Thurgood Marshall's boss. Okay. He says, you know, in my biography, I mentioned it. I said, you, I never read his biography. I ordered it. And he says, I was a little, I, he says, I know why you're concerned about this. And I simply said that Judge Waring pushed Thurgood um, to attack um, segregation root branch. He says, I was talking about this conversation. Well, I thought that's pretty good evidence. And I had a guy outside the room who's immediately told by Marshall, and now I have one of, historically one of the most important African-American judges in American history telling me he knew the story from the from the executive secretary of the NAACP. That, that was a pretty good corroboration. And, you know, I, I was expecting maybe a little pushback from people. No one's pushed back. Everybody, you know, people kind of knew the story. I mean, not outside the NAACP, but let me say I've heard from several sources that that was a known story. It was sensitive. You know, the judge is ex parte, a third good marshal. I had a wonderful conversation with, with Cheryl and Eiffel. Um, she appeared on a program with me. Uh, she's been a big fan of the book. And um, of course, she's is the successor of Thurgood Marshall as mm -hmm. the head of the Illegal Defense Fund. And she says, you know, Waring's um, advice, encouragement, maybe even demand to Marshall was incredibly risky. So this could have this could have been a disaster. In fact, we have a very important development, she says, that probably determined the outcome. 
the death of Fred Vincent as Chief Justice. And she said, perhaps it would have been terrible advice had he lived. But anyway, that's a, that, that was another, you know, uh, me pursuing different leads and threads in the story using different sources. Um, and, um, and eventually the narrative appeared. The, I, I like to say that an example courage emerged the whole string of things. And, and did I conceive it? I will say once I had those various threads, uh, I was a little bit like a chess, a, a chess player. I could see the whole board. And I then wanted to, to tell the story. Well, um, I lived on the internet a lot. Um, when I wrote my first book on the Jews of Columbia, the internet wasn't nearly as prominent. and I spent most of my time in archives and remote places digging out stories. Um, boy, what a luxury of the internet. Um, and so I was, um, I, I would sometimes on a Saturday morning, I'd sit there on doing searches on Isaac Woodard, another wonderful, unusual name. Had it been Isaac Woodward, it would have been a lot harder to find him, but Isaac Woodard was an unusual name. And one of those days of randomly chasing um, uh, the internet, I came across a letter Julian Bond wrote. He had written it, as I recall, for, to a filmmaker who was contemplating doing a documentary on Isaac Woodard many years ago, 20 years ago perhaps, maybe not that long, something a bit not, it wasn't recent. And the letter endorsing the, um, the project from Julian Bond said that it was that Isaac Woodard was the um, spark that started the modern civil rights movement. Well, that was in some ways part of my hypothesis that it was this very influential. I would say it started the movement. I would say it was important moment in the history. Um, and um, I was um, thus curious why the great Julian Bond thought that, because he didn't say why, he just said there was a spark that began the Civil Rights Movement. So I um, um, went on the internet looking for the telephone of Julian Bond and uh, found it listed, home number, on the internet. And of course, I got a voicemail and I said, told him I was working on this book on Wade is Wearing. I came across this, um, this reference to Isaac Woodard. He was a very important person in all this. And I wanted to know why he had made that statement. And like four days later, out of the blue, Julian Bond calls me. He doesn't know me. I don't, you know, I don't know him. I did drop the fact that I was a United States District Judge. I didn't think I'd heard. Uh, and um, I was working on this story. And he said to me, you know, tell me what you're working on. And I told him it was about Waitis Waring. He says, my dad knew Waitis Waring very well. They were friends. I said, he said, I, I think I even met Judge Waring in my house as a child. Because his father was president of Lincoln University. Judge Waring, was, I think, had an honorary doctorate. From Lincoln, yes, and was a big supporter of Lincoln. And, um, and as a side note, uh, Reverend Delane, the lead plaintiff and the, the leader of the organization that put together the plaintiffs in Briggs v. Elliott, Reverend Delane, who's featured prominently in my book, has his house burned down. I have a picture of his house. After the trial, because Waring was getting ready to retire, he invited the entire Delane family to his home, which is pretty unusual in South and Broad in 1952. And they have like lunch there, the whole family, the kids, everybody, the wife, Reverend Delane. And Judge Waring says to his oldest son, Joseph, son, where are you, how old are you? He says, I'm I'm 17. 
uh, where are you going to college? He says, well, my dad wants me to stay in North Carolina. And I think there's a, I can't remember the school right now, but it's in Charlotte. Johnson C. Smith in Charlotte. And I really don't want to go there. I want to leave home. His dad lived in Charlotte. Well, the truth was, Drove and Delane couldn't afford Sam anywhere else. You know, he couldn't. And he says, um, well, um, where would you like to go? You want to go to Howard? He says, no, I want to go to Lincoln University. And Joe Delane would tell me later that his father was furious with him for having talked, brought this in front of the judge. Several weeks later, he gets an envelope in his home, full scholarship to Lincoln. He goes. Judge Waring had arranged it with Julian's father. Um, uh, um, Judge Waring believed that Reverend Delane was the real hero of the civil rights. If you asked him, it was Reverend Delane. Um, uh, Judge Waring later would, um, you know, the, the, uh, Reverend Delane was a, um, had a church in upstate New York, I think it's Buffalo, Buffalo or Rochester, one of those. And the name of the school, uh, the name of the church still today is the Delane Waring AME Church. Mm -hmm. um, now let me go back to Julian Bond. So he's telling me the story of his dad's relationship with um, with Judge Waring, and I said, "Well, he, uh, Mr. Bond, I, I I told him a story about Harry Truman." He says, you know, I was former chairman of the board of NAACP, and I know the story about um, Walter White telling Harry Truman about Isaac Woodard. I know that story. He says, it's kind of legend within the NAACP. And um, I said, well, I have this hypothesis that this incident inspired um, Harry Truman to to go on a journey that eventually desegregated the armed forces of the United States. And Waitus Waring inspired Waitus Waring on a journey that eventually wrote, was basically the father of Brown versus Board. And I was wondering, is that what you were thinking about why it was the spark that began the civil rights movement? He said, well, that's very interesting. But no, that's not why. That's all very interesting. But no, that wasn't why I said it. I said, "Well, Mr. Bond, why did you say it?" He was silent for a moment, and then he said, "Well, there's a photograph. I remember from my childhood, and it was a picture of a blinded soldier, and." As he began to try to describe the picture to me, he began weeping. He was describing to me that picture. That's the picture he was describing to me. And as he attempted to describe it, he began weeping. I sat on the phone for about 60 seconds with, it, with this civil rights legend I'd never met who was weeping. And then he finally says, Judge, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry, as upset as I have gotten. But 70 years later, I still weep for that blinded soldier. That is what inspired the modern civil rights movement that picture. It inspired me and a whole generation of young men and women who were horrified by the cruelty of that act. That's why I said it. Well, you know, uh, he goes, he's in the Georgia Senate very early. And many of the early African-American elected officials were 
pretty circumspect. They recognized they were sort of historic figures. They didn't try to rock the boat too much. They were, you know, they were trying to be um, to open a path for others. And they were, um, many of them were elected with a sort of coalition of white support, right? Sort of enlightened white people support with the African American community. No rap on these people. They're not, they're not like they weren't. Um, advocates, but they they were not your frontline civil rights people, generally speaking. That's not how you got elected those early officials. Julian Bond was, I mean, he gets thrown out of the Georgia Senate for um, for opposing the Vietnam War. He's the real thing, and I think he represented a model that I think inspired an entire generation of activists to go into elected office, and many followed him. He was. In my view, and I'm sure you, somebody could point out to me there were others, but he's the one that resonates with me, and certainly the one who got national attention for doing it. He then goes on and becomes very sort of an institutionalist. He becomes the chairman of the board of the NAACP at a very important time in the history. You'll help me over the years, but he's a very important person in kind of steadying the boat of the NAACP. Um, so yeah, I think he's like a really important historic figure. And, you know, and you mentioned Vernon Jordan. Um, I had the great honor of Vernon Jordan coming to hear me speak at Martha's Vineyard when I was there for the conference. He, and he asked and arranged to meet with me. And we had a wonderful conversation. Um, you know, Vernon Jordan was sort of the opposite. He wasn't the guy who was raising hell. He was the guy incredibly skilled working himself into the establishment, right, in a way that made him one of the most important influential African-American leaders of his time. Um, nothing to say bad about either one of them, they're just different styles, but Julian Bond was a really important, in my view, really important transitional figure of really taking the activists into elected office. I mean, I'm, I'm not been much of a student of that era, um, but I, you know, long admired him because you know, I thought he had the guts to, and, and, you know, I'm a great admirer of Dr. King, but I, I think his willingness to speak out against the Vietnam War was remarkable when everybody was telling him, you're going to divide the African-American community and all that. And he just said, you know, i got to do what I think is right, not what's popular.